Hello and welcome to Sport Unlocked, the podcast digesting the week's sports news with interviews and analysis. And according to the latest data this week, the 13th most popular sports pod in Argentina. Thank you all for listening. And as ever, always grateful when you can hit subscribe. So we land in your podcast feeds to hear myself, Rob Harris from the Associated Press, Martin Ziegler from the Times and Tarek Panja from the New York Times. Welcome along, guys. It's certainly sounding quite familiar, isn't it, this year ends with uh, coronavirus affecting sport across the continent, particularly of Europe. Yeah. Hola, chaps. Hola. Yeah, we and um, to, to everyone listening in Argentina, great to have you with us. The uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit depressing, I have to say. New restrictions being announced by the government. I mean, the Premier League clubs have all been planning for this eventuality. So this thing about everyone having to show a vaccine passport or a negative test that's actually already happening at a lot of the clubs. Chelsea, they they check everybody who's going in. So um, and other clubs are doing spot checks. So I think that they've been waiting for this and preparing for it. So it shouldn't be a sort of huge, huge change. I think the more concern is what happens in the future. Um, if I mean, Boris Johnson hinted it could be full vaccination passports, but negative tests won't be enough. And that provides a, a very difficult situation for clubs who have unvaccinated players. This is the announcement from Boris Johnson that any outdoor venue with a capacity over 10,000 seated, you're going to have to provide vaccination proof or a negative test, which is a logistical nightmare. It is something we have seen in other countries, whether it's Portugal are asking for proof of a negative test or recovery from COVID-19 and new restrictions on capacities in the Netherlands, in Germany as well, and we're getting games being affected, particularly, in, for instance, Tottenham's Europa Conference League game against Wren being postponed and, you know, really is a reminder for the, the, the challenge facing sport. To be honest with you, I don't find it that much of a ordeal, to be honest. Most, you know, travel to the continent recently and in France, for example, to go into a cafe, even a Starbucks coffee or any coffee shop. You 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 show your vaccine status. It takes a second. There's someone scans it and you, you go in. It, I just think people have shown wherever they are in the world, we're extremely adaptable. We get used to stuff. Things that might seem like a massive crisis and oh my god, how are we going to do this? I think we've seen over the last couple of years to shown that we can overcome most things and just get on with it. Um, it might seem when these announcements are made that there's going to be this great ordeal, but I just think download an app. Get on with it. Have you been boosted, guys? Yep. Very, very happy to say I've been boosted and also really pleased to see the news that the um, Pfizer vaccine is very potent against this new variant, which is, Rob, you're quite good at pronouncing things. What's it called? Omicron. Although I'm yet to get the uh, booster. I wait my turn. No jump in the queue as I wait for the age group to come up and... uh... Yeah, certainly take it when it comes. Well, I, I got my booster this week, actually. Um, and uh, yeah, it was Pfizer as opposed to AstraZeneca. So that's good, good to hear that, Tarek. I didn't realise that, but that's good. Yeah, really good. And you're absolutely fine. Of course, one of football's most high-profile unvaccinated players is Bayern Munich's and Germany's Joshua Kimmich, who tested positive for coronavirus a couple of weeks ago, hasn't played since the start of November, also after being deemed a close contact of someone else. And now he actually has a lung problem. Don't know reason why he says it's a slight infiltration of the lung, but he's not going to be back until January. Um, Do you know what? It's quite common, I've noticed, amongst athletes and, and sports people, also in that nebulous wellness sector, where there seems to be a lot of messaging among certain sectors, uh, certain people within that sector of not wanting to be vaccinated. Um, and there isn't, isn't really based on any, any science or any, any sort of uh, mainstream science, I suppose. Um, it's, it's curious why, why athletes and sports people, you know, in, in larger numbers and perhaps other segments of society don't want to do it. Martin, you, you got any idea? You notice that at all? Well, I know that some clubs have been um, different, having different experiences to others, like talking in football terms. I mean, the Manchester United and Brighton are a fair way behind other clubs for, for various reasons. And I, th- from you know, anecdotally, it's um, it's it's sort of 
it's put within the squad. It's like somebody saying that they've heard they've heard of a bad experience suffered by somebody else who had took the vaccine. And I think that sort of word of mouth thing creates some sort of concern amongst the players, which is why, for example, they might have down a 60% double jabbed rate compared to others. I don't know, Leeds United, I think they've got 100%. And yet so many players are willing to have uh, pain-killing jabs in their knees and other joints to play on, seemingly with the sort of disregard for the long-term implications of it. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, Maybe, maybe, maybe they're like Nicki Minaj at the, in the Man United dressing room. <laughs> well, of course, the effects of the pandemic are impacting the build-up to the Beijing Winter Olympics that are due to start in February. We have heard from the NHL that they will agree for hockey players to go to the games. They didn't go to South Korea in 2018, but there's a lot of hesitation from the players about whether or not they do go to China. And in part, it centers on the potential three-week quarantine in Beijing if someone tests positive out there and no certainty at all whether someone could leave the country, for instance, to go back home. And that certainly put off Robin Lehner of Sweden, who plays for the Vegas Golden Knights, who said he won't go to the Olympics. He said he took a long time to take the decision and he tweeted, my well-being has to come first and being locked down and not knowing what happens if you test positive is too much of a risk for me. Coronavirus regulations, just one reason why people might not choose to go to compete at the Olympics in the country where COVID-19 originated. There's also the spectre of human rights as the reason why Politicians in particular from certain countries won't now be going to those Olympics in less than two months. We've heard from the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand and Britain that there will be a diplomatic boycott of those Winter Olympics. Let's hear how the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced the boycott. I don't think the decision by Canada or by many other countries uh, to choose to not send a diplomatic representation to the Beijing Olympics and Paralympics is going to come as a surprise to China. We have been very clear uh, over the past many years of our deep concerns around human rights violations, uh, and this uh, is a continuation of us expressing our deep concerns for human rights violations. It's been very clear uh, that concerns around arbitrary detention are real and are shared by many many dozens of countries around the world, which is why we saw uh, such uh, tremendous participation and sign on to our declaration uh, against arbitrary detention. Um, we will continue to stand very, very clearly as a world uh, against the use of uh, coercive diplomacy and uh, tools like arbitrary detention. At the same time, uh, we will be there absolutely as countries, as a, as a country, but as a world as well, to support all the athletes gathering uh, in uh, Beijing uh, over this coming winter. We know that our athletes need to have one thing in mind, that is representing their countries to the best of their ability and uh, winning that home gold medal for Canada. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau there well, the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson faced questions on diplomatic boycotts of the Olympics during Prime Minister's questions on Wednesday when he faced this question from the former Conservative Party leader, Ian Duncan-Smith. May I support the request that the UK government now acts against this dictatorial, brutal Chinese regime that is persecuting everybody from Christians through to Tibetans and uh, terrorising the Uyghurs would the British government follow suit to the Americans, the Australians, even the Lithuanians? And please, please, I beg of him, give a lead for human rights and make a diplomatic boycott of these Olympic Games. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, it was clear from what I said uh, earlier on uh, that the, go the government uh, has uh, no hesitation in raising uh, these issues with China, as I did with President Xi uh, the last time I talked to him, uh, and there will be, there will be effectively a, a diplomatic boycott of the uh, there will be a diplomatic boycott of the uh, of the Winter Olympics in Beijing. No ministers are expected to attend. What well, I think the House uh, and, and, and no officials, Mr. Speaker. But what I can tell the House is that 
uh, I do not think that sporting boycotts are sensible, and that remains the policy of the government. Boris Johnson there even seemed a bit reticent at one point to even call it a diplomatic boycott. So how much will the politicians even be missed in Beijing, and will it have any impact at all on the Chinese government and their ways, the fact that ministers and national leaders from certain countries aren't going to be going to the Olympics? Well, it's an easy way out, isn't it? I mean, it, it, the, it, the England did it for well, Great Britain, I should say. The UK did it for R the Russian World Cup in 2018. Um, it, 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 it would be quite difficult politically anyway to be seen to be uh, like some a minister going over to Beijing and giving tacit approval to what uh, what's taking place in China. But there's so many controversial things happening there, not least the sort of the Uyghurs and human rights crackdown in, in Hong Kong, etc. So, yeah, I think this is a fairly easy um, step for UK, America, Australia to take. And it doesn't actually affect China that much at all. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. It's been well telegraphed as well. It's almost... You could have written that story at any point in the last few months. They just happened to announce it this this week that this was what's going to happen. Um, and the thing with China, it's this Olympics is different because China's different. I remember in in two thousand and eight, George W. Bush, from U.S. president at the time, he I think he travelled to the the Beijing Olympics. And lots lots happened there, Martin. You, you you've just you've described how how China has changed. Also the the idea of China, I remember um, in the build up to 2008, there were human rights concerns and what, what the IOC and others were saying was, well, look, it's by welcoming, welcoming China into the world of nations, this coming out party or whatever Beijing 2008 was supposed to be, will change them and will actually improve the human rights situation and make China kind of behave in a way that perhaps the West will find more palatable in that intervening time. The very opposite has happened. I think 2008, the main human rights issue was around Tibet. That's still there. And we got Tibet. You mentioned the Uyghurs, Hong Kong, more saber rattling over Taiwan as well now. China is a more muscular force in the world and, and, and its relationship with the West has actually got worse. So, yeah, kind of inevitable, really. In many ways, there's probably been less focus on Hong Kong just due to the lack of travel there uh, because of the pandemic restrictions but certainly the erosions of democratic freedoms in Hong Kong has been an absolutely significant issue particularly it was obviously just as the pandemic uh, was starting which is an issue that has led to significantly increased tensions between Britain and Hong Kong but as we look to the Olympics the thing is President Xi is still going to be able to have his lineup of significant world leaders there far beyond the um, the western orbit of those politicians who who might be um, abandoning going so it's not going to look particularly different for him because he's still going to get to parade with leading world figures i would imagine at those olympics yeah probably yeah i mean there's going to be a, a, a you know a basket of world leaders who are more than happy to be um along alongside him both from a political point of view but also in that time china has invested a huge amount of money in parts of the world in in, in africa for example parts of Eastern Europe, across the world, this Belt and Road program, for example, that China is is invested in, has uh, bought them a lot of political influence in 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 countries that that aren't you know those those big Western players we mentioned. Well, one person it seems who doesn't want to offend China in any way at all is the IOC president Thomas Bach, and he brushed aside talk of boycotts diplomatically even, and very much focused on the athletes when he was asked about politicians not going to the Olympics from the countries we've been talking about. The presence of government uh, officials is a purely political uh, decision for uh, each uh, government. And also for this uh, political uh, decision, the principle of uh, the political neutrality of uh, the IOC applies. The integrity of the Games are about the integrity of the sports uh, competitions. And uh, therefore, and the, the, we have our full uh, focus, uh, you know, on the, on the, the, the athletes. So the games are about uh, and for the, the athletes, and therefore you you will hear uh, 
the same comment uh, uh, from from us uh, for for every uh, political uh, decision uh, from uh, from uh, any uh, government uh, we have been concerned uh, with uh, the athletes we welcome that uh, they can participate uh, that they are supported uh, by their national governments and uh, the rest is uh, politics and uh, their uh, our political neutrality uh, the principle is applied. Thomas Bach there being predictably neutral, sitting on the fence, not wanting to do anything that offends the Chinese government in any way with the Olympics and Paralympics so close. And it really reflects how things have been for many months now, not wanting to criticise them over the crackdown of the Uyghur minority. And that's despite human rights activists really stepping up the pressure on China and whether they are in fact suitable of hosts of the Olympics and Paralympics, given their uh, treatment of a Muslim minority. In fact, it seems there's only one group that the IOC at the moment wants to take on and does directly criticise in public, and that is FIFA, football in particular, and particularly Gianni Infantino's plans for biennial World Cups. And we've had it at the Olympic summit that's been held this week, where we're told from the IOC that serious concerns were voiced by sports leaders against those plans for more frequent World Cups. And Gianni Fantina, the FIFA president, had to face that criticism on the call with his fellow sports execs. Infantino himself is an IOC member and he assured them that these are still preliminary plans and actually part of a wider conversation about the future match calendar. So... Maybe that is him backing away from those plans, but certainly felt the ire of the IOC. Something, again, that China has not faced from Thomas Bach over the fate of Peng Shui, the three-time Olympian, has not been spoken to independently, apart from calls with the IOC in recent times, since she went missing. And yes, we have now seen her in those still images that the IOC have produced, but we still don't know anything said specifically in the form of Wimbledon doubles champions call with Thomas Bach. And he was questioned again this week about Peng Shui. She is obviously in a very fragile uh, situation. Uh, if uh, uh, there uh, you, you see uh, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, allegations uh, she made, and if you uh, try to uh, put yourself, you know, into uh, the a human being uh, confronted uh, with uh, such a, a situation, and uh, also realizing uh, what effect uh, this uh, has uh, in, in 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 the world. Uh, you can easily imagine and uh, feel uh, that uh, uh, this, uh, you know, does not uh, left you as a, as a human being untouched, and uh, this is why. Uh, we are uh, we are offering uh, this uh, support uh, to her. We are uh, uh, in uh, her uh, reports and uh, in uh, her declarations and uh, telling about her life uh, and uh, her, her story. Uh, so uh, uh, I haven't heard any doubt by by anybody about uh, this uh, identity. And uh, uh, secondly, I can assure you that uh, all aspects uh, of uh, this uh, case are being discussed uh, with the Chinese side. Thomas Bach notably doesn't mention sexual assault. He just refers generically to the accusations being levelled by Peng Shui. Of course, that serious claim was made by her against a former vice premier of China. Tarek, you're on the video press conference with Thomas Bach. What did you make of his answers? Several questions about this. And I was left with kind of no more information. A lot of words. He, he spoke a lot. But there was just still no detail. He said he, he initiated the contact. I mean, the language as well was so kind of robotic. You know, as a human being at the end of the line here, we're talking about her feelings. It was all couched in extremely cautious language. I don't know who the call was initiated with, how that person or that group managed to convince Peng Shui that she should speak to Thomas Bach, why Thomas Bach and the IOC are able to talk to Peng Shui when the WTA and, and tennis players, Martin Navratilova, haven't been able to speak with her. 
just so many questions still, and it just leaves you with that sense of unease still about the fate of this this woman, this former tennis player or current tennis player, and any of their messaging, any of the any of the language of the IOC has not addressed any of the allegations. It's just been brushed over into kind of cautious language like her difficult situation or wor- words to that effect anyway. And it's just really strange that that's just something they just refuse to engage with at all, which is, you would have thought, it was very serious. And that's the most significant part of all this. It's about sexual assault allegations, and it seems an inconvenience in many ways for the IOC and something they don't want to even address. And we've probably seen in the past how they've been slow to react on sexual assault cases too and allegations against even IOC members particularly around uh, the Me Too movement and and that emboldening people to come forward with stories of, and their allegations and the latest from the world of tennis is that the uh, International Tennis Federation still resisting taking any big move against China in the way the women's tour has suspended competitions there we've heard actually from the president of the ITF David Haggerty who's also an IOC member saying the governing body, they don't want to punish a billion people as if taking tournaments away from China would punish the entire country. Certainly my sense with some of these non-Grand Slam tennis events in particular is the fact they're quite localised events anyway. I mean, if it was, uh, you know, the event as they used to have it at the O2 Arena, I don't think many people in the UK would notice if it wasn't taking place there, as it no longer is. It's now in Italy. Yeah, it completely, feels completely self-serving, Rob. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but all of the reaction has been entirely predictable from China, from the IOC, from World Athletics. Seb Coe said something similar to the ITF. President Haggerty is also an IOC member now. Um, the only surprise in terms of reaction has been the WTA. It's the only organization that's been willing to leave money on the table. It's the only organization that's willing to really use strong language to condemn what it feels has happened in China with Peng Shui, has made significant demands. That, for me, is the only surprise that there has been a sporting governing body that has put its head above the parapet and has put its its um, values above its balance sheet. And human rights are not the only concern for sports out from Asia, where we see so many betting companies appearing, particularly on football shirts, and so many white label gambling companies as well, emanating from the region and it's a growing concern isn't it for um for sports and some of the associations and martin something you in particular have been looking into yeah so i mean gambling in china is actually illegal i mean although it's ironically it's a huge market so you have all these sort of um gambling platforms in the far east which are targeted towards china online gambling things um, and they have these mirror sites. So if they get closed down, and they go to another site, and a lot of these are sponsoring British English football clubs, particularly, and they're doing so through their, a sort of what's called a white label arrangement with, with the company in the Isle of Man. So Manchester United with a company called HTH, Everton have just announced an official Asian betting partner with a, a new company called I8. Um, and it's actually, all, as we're talking about with the cryptocurrency things, it's it's impossible to find out anything about who actually owns these companies. Um, any due diligence is meant to be done by this Isle of Man organisation. The Gambling Commission aren't involved. But I think, it, interestingly, from a, what I've heard from government sources, is the gambling review, which is due out in the new year, is going to look really, really closely at these white label arrangements. So I think this sort of gravy train of like murky betting companies sponsoring English football clubs is, is going to come to an end, which is probably, as we've talked before at some length, why they're now looking at cryptocurrency uh, platforms to take the place of the gambling ones, but equally murky. Completely e- unregulated. Equally unregulated, yeah. And we're not likely to see clubs take any sort of moral stand against these sorts of sponsorships that are so disconcerting to so many. When, when have you seen a sports club take a moral choice when it's come to a, a financial project, a sponsorship project? I, I can't recall. Um, and unless you've been exposed or unless there's fan unrest, I've never seen an example of a club saying, oh, no, I'm sorry, we, we can't accept your money. Uh, Martin, we, you mentioned the, the funny situation 
a few weeks ago with Manchester City and its crypto partner, you you ended up Googling this company and found out that it may not even exist or the people behind it may not even exist. Uh, and the club only reacted after that had been highlighted. I just I just can't see a moral stance being taken when it comes to sponsorship of any kind at the moment. It's exactly why you end up needing government and the regulatory authorities to step in and just prohibit it. Obviously, there is the talk of a complete blanket ban on betting sponsors in England. In a way, we've already seen moves in in Spain in particular. But it comes at a time when there is significant growth in betting in American sports. Broadcasts there in particular are covered with betting odds and partnerships as well. And they're sort of witnessing the sort of birth of the uh, growth of that, but with the underlying concerns. They've got a model. They've got a, a concrete model on which to piggyback on English football in particular and its, related, and its TV coverage is festooned with betting adverts. And it's something that we've, we've had here for, for over a decade. There isn't a game on TV in, in the UK that goes by without odds, live odds at half time. I can't recall a match I've seen, honestly, in the last 10 years in the commercial break between, you know, first half and second half where where a figure hasn't popped up on television telling you to bet now and and the and the odds so maybe maybe the US have got that to come you know good luck to them betting companies providing a key source of income for clubs and leagues in England in particular in football another place where revenue is coming from in sport is from private equity firms and the latest deal to be clinched by CBC is with Spain's La Liga on Friday 37 of the 42 clubs in the competitions did agree to this plan that would see almost 2 billion euros injected into the competition. So a windfall for clubs. CBC get a 10% stake in a new commercial entity joint venture with La Liga. Questions over those terms, certainly. And resistance in particular coming from Real Madrid and Barcelona. They proposed an alternative investment plan that they thought would offer better terms from the banks. It's not been taken up by La Liga, and this is yet another source of friction between the league's two biggest clubs and the league's leadership, of course, coming in the fallout from the Super League, a plan that uh, Barcelona and Real Madrid are still clinging on to. Yeah, this this is a, a very tendentious, tension-filled, angst-filled situation La Liga finds itself in. Three of its most historic clubs, Real Madrid, Barcelona and Athletic Club de Bilbao, are in open revolt over this deal with CVC Capital Partners, um, a fund that is looking to invest and profit handsomely from all manner of sports. We've talked about them before. Any sports deal at the moment where leagues or teams are trying to raise capital CVC seem to be at, at the table. And, and the, the objection is this, that the deal that has been struck with La, between La Liga and CVC is really very much in favour of CVC in return for about 2 billion euros. CVC will get a significant, make a significant profit, even if, even if TV rights don't go up, even if they go down a bit, CVC stands to gain. What these clubs are saying is, how, how have we come to this where we're giving away money, all this value to this private equity company at, at a rate of, um, it, it, I think they're giving away 10% to, to CVC when there are cheaper financing options out there. You, you know, Real Madrid have come up with a counter offer, they say, which is much more sustainable with JP Morgan, who the bank that they teamed up with uh, during the aborted Super League, they, they are saying the cost of financing for that is 881 million in interest over a 25 year period, whereas the 2 billion that CBC are investing, even in the most pessimistic situation, would result over 50 years in a 4.7 billion 
euro return to to, to CVC Capital Partners. To me, I've, I've kind of looked at it as well, and it feels like heads I win, uh, tails you lose situation with CVC always doing well. La Liga essentially would have to collapse for CVC to to struggle in this. And and the other thing that struck me on top of this, there's this seven year contract that Javier Tebas, the CEO of La Liga, will get as the CEO of this kind of joint venture as well, this joint venture company. So he potentially stands to do work quite well out of this as well. Again, it's one of these football deals where there perhaps warrants a degree of transparency. There wasn't a tender for this. This was La Liga and CVC coming together and then it being offered to the clubs. Clubs are often in dire straits at the moment and being offered, you know, a boatload of money up front now. And the future is is anyone's guess. Now, a lot of owners will take the money now because they probably don't expect to own their teams in 50 years' time, which is different to member-owned teams like Barca, Real and Athletic Club de Bilbao. That might be another reason why they're, they're, they're not up for it. On the other hand, La Liga will tell you that anything La Liga tries to do, Real Madrid will reject because they are trying to destabilise the league and Florentino Perez and, and, and Javier Tebas are in this sort of war where whatever one wants, the other one will be up, will, will be against regardless. Do you think any private equity partners interested in a pod, sporting podcast, do you think? Definitely be an open tender. Surely bigger than that, a stock market flotation. <laughs> the, talk, talking, of, uh, talking of billions, of, billions of, of dollars and pounds or whatever, interesting that the uh, 49ers have increased their stake um, in Leeds United to 44%. And it's emerged that they've got the the rights, basically, to, to buy the whole club um, up until 2024. Now, I think Andrea Redrazzani, the, the, the current major shareholder, sort of reacted angrily to, when, when this emerged and said that his company had, had the right to veto to that, to that sale. But it does show, actually, that... Um, this you know, the Americans are still very very keen on Premier League teams, English Premier League teams, aren't they? And interestingly, I from I understand that a few weeks ago, Forty um, Niners Enterprises took a, a a group of Leeds United people over to America and introduced them to their sort of uh, board, and just like, looked around, and the, you know, the board of Enterprises basically is one billionaire after another, so. You can quite see um, that you know, obviously Rad is a rich man, but he he doesn't have that sort of wealth if he thinks Leeds need to go to another level. No, and also be a handsome return for for him as well. He's done really well out of Leeds. Yeah, he, he's done a great job in getting to the Premier League and got them good investors. But that price tag for for um, total control, this this deal that. Apparently is in place values Leeds United at more than four hundred million pounds. That's significantly more than he he paid for it. Um, and yes, there has been investment in the team, and he's going to do quite well. And he's 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 uh, he's done well in his deals over the time when he was at MP and Silver, that broadcast company, um, sports rights company. He managed to get a huge amount of money. We had people uh, shocked the amount this Chinese investment company had paid for, for for MP and Silver, this rights business, because they couldn't believe it was worth that much. Um, and it turns out it might not have been. MP and Silver and the Chinese, under Chinese ownership, appears to have all but collapsed. And in fact, that case is still going through the High Court, actually, uh, Tarek. That's not been resolved. It's an ongoing High Court case in England. And of course, has avoided much significant capital investiture in uh, Ellen Road as well. So, uh, you know, a handsome return for him on a club. Uh, obviously, they'll need to try and stay in the Premier League, as will uh, Newcastle United, who are in far more dire straits. But they have at least managed this week to strip off those sports direct signs. The Mike Ashley era has been removed. The signs of it now all ready to uh, get those Saudi companies uh, branding across St. James's Park. Yeah, the uh, eventually the, when the Premier League yeah. does allow it. Yeah, it looks like the uh, moratorium on related party 
sponsorship deals is going to be lifted by the Premier League next week uh, at a meeting. Um, that means that they will be able to sign up Saudi-related companies. However, they will have to be approved by the Premier League and they have to be of fair market value. So that will be an interesting one. Another significant thing which I think should happen at that meeting is that the owner's charter, which was brought in as a result of the European Super League, um, that should be uh, agreed, I think. There's an interesting, the big six have been stalling because they don't, they don't, they're, they're worried that if they sign up to it and UEFA go ahead with this idea of having two places for the Champions League awarded on coefficient ranking, that they won't be able to take part in it because the suggested wording of the chart is that all clubs agree to qualification based on current sporting merit, not historical sporting merit. So that's an interesting one too. Mm. Uh, speaking of the Premier League and you mentioned that Newcastle sign, Rob. Something struck me this week. I watched the former UK sports minister, Tracy Crouch, who's, who's been on this pod before, speaking to um, uh, a committee of parliamentarians about the reforms, a reform project for for the for English football, the idea of this independent regulator. But the thing that struck me, I don't know about you two, was... Um, she was asked about the Saudi Arabia deal and she was really caught, really, really didn't want to talk about it. Uh, she didn't want to talk, an MP said, would a, would a regulator prevent something like this? Whether it can, yeah, yeah, whether a regulator can and cannot didn't seem like the point. She just really did not want to get into the, the Saudi deal, pretty much parroted the exact lines from the Premier League about it you know, getting these sort of legally binding assurances that this Saudi Arabian takeover won't be controlled by Saudi Arabia, etc. I, I, I was quite struck by that. And I was wondering why she was being so coy, given she's so outspoken on all these other issues in football. And we can take a listen now to that exchange from the Parliamentary Select Committee when Conservative Party MP Tracy Crouch, former sports minister, was questioned by John Nicholson, an MP with the Scottish National Party. Um, I'm interested in the integrity uh, test yeah. that you talk about um, and the whole idea that prospective owners of clubs should be of good character. Um, the new owner of Newcastle would presumably have failed that test. Well, it's a fund. so Yeah, but the fund is the country and the country is the ruler. Well, I mean, I, I'd be very careful on this question because I haven't actually seen all the details of the Newcastle takeover bid so it is difficult for me to know um, but my understanding is that the Premier League received assurances um, of a legal separation between the, the state of Saudi Arabia yeah. and the fund. That can't really be taken seriously in the case of sound. That's, that's, not, that's not for me to answer but in terms but it, of the it, it, integrity test and the good character test we haven't just made this up this already exists in the banking securities and insurance sector um, as a test and so you know it is a test that is applied in in other regulated environments that we think can apply uh, in terms of uh, football as well. That's a wee bit worrying though isn't it because that means that we would continue to take assurances from uh, a country like Saudi Arabia given to the football authorities, which would still allow the whitewashing of the sports washing of, of cash from monstrous regimes like Saudi Arabia. Well, we can set out a test in terms of, you know, for, for the own, ownership of a football club. Um, I think it's, you know, we, we've tried to... Um, make sure that there is a greater integrity test in the owners and directors test. Um, and I, I, I don't know all the details of the takeover bid. I hear what you say, um, and I know that there is concern about um, the PIF takeover of Newcastle. It certainly is. Um, but that's, that wasn't for the report. Tracy Crouch seemed very reticent to criticise Saudi Arabia. She's meant to be this free independent spirit, but uh, certainly a bit more restrained there. As these Concerns do linger. We've just come off the back of the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix as well. Yes, Lewis Hamilton wore that rainbow helmet, but the Saudis win in the end because actually everyone was saying what a tremendous race it was, how memorable it was in Jeddah. So what a perfect PR platform for them. We've got the F1 season ending in Abu Dhabi. And talking of sports in the Gulf, if it is a sport, which some do debate, is the conclusion of the World Chess Championships in Dubai as well. 
for those for those who are following the chess a recent convert to the to the sport yes it is mind sport um i i would say it's it's it's, it's quite um a, rem- a remarkable features a remarkable talent there in magnus carlson uh, perhaps one of the best players to have ever played played the game if you're if you're following a lot of good reports out there and sean ingle our colleague in the guardian has written quite a few articles on on these world championships been out there himself so uh I would recommend some of his articles on on the subject. Well worth checking out. Magnus Carlsen did defend his title. He's now a five-time world champion after victory in Dubai. He beat the Russian Ian Nipomichi. And uh, it was pretty tense apparently up until this final game when uh, he resigned. uh, Draw after draw, then mistakes with the pawns allowing Carlsen to attack. Check it out if you're really going to go in depth on that. Uh, favorite chess piece, anyone? The one that's most useful is the uh, bishop. No, no, no. Well, no, you can't no. count the queen. The knight. No, I don't like that knight thing. The bishop is not. No. He's not diagonal. No. He, can, he can just keep going in diagonal places. No. I mean, even the castle is better than the bishop. Oh. But no, no. Well, I'm a no. beginner. Maybe. Like, if Maybe my view. If you, think, if you don't think the knight is the most useful, but well, not obviously apart from the queen. Well, do, do you think? Um, well, I've been losing to my seven-year-old nephew at most times we play. So that might give you the. Uh, well, yeah. Well, start, <laughs> start focusing on the knight. Uh, all right. I better not venture an opinion here. It seems to have been an unexpectedly fiery and contentious end to the show this week. Certainly, what we're discovering is quite a bit of money in chess. Magnus Carlsen winning 1.2 million euros for winning that title in Dubai. Perhaps I shouldn't have stopped competing many years ago, but that's a whole other story. As we bring a close to this week's episode of Sport Unlocked, so for me, Rob Harris and Martin Ziegler and Tarek Panja, if you've got any feedback, we're grateful to receive it as ever. We're at Sport Unlocked on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And if you are enjoying us, we'll drop in your pod feed automatically if you just hit subscribe now. And also, if you feel like it, rate and review us. But for now, whatever sport you're viewing in the days ahead, hope it's enjoyable. Thank you for listening. 